good afternoon, good evening, and a very warm welcome to each and every one of you to this uh, event this evening. I am particularly happy to see such a large turnout uh, this evening because as we were discussing here at the podium that today there are such a large number of events that are taking place in the town and uh, several of them in uh, 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 very interesting and exciting programs and several of them in uh, uh, rather luxurious five-star hotel settings but the fact that all of you have decided to come here I think that speaks volumes about the star attraction power of the panelists that we have and uh, they have uh, my galaxy of panelists has told me that you will not be disappointed so I think all of us can really look forward to a very interesting informative and an exciting uh, program uh, I extend a very warm welcome also to my team of uh, panelists and uh, uh, they don't need any introduction. In any case, uh, all their resumes have been uh, circulated in the messages that have come to you. Uh, they represent their countries uh, in India and they're doing a fantastic uh, job. And I compliment and congratulate them. Uh, the Finnish ambassador is not here with us uh, yet, but I definitely wanted to extend uh, a particular uh, gratitude and appreciation because uh, I recall very well that just a few uh, months ago, in fact, uh, soon after the India Nordic Summit that took place in Stockholm on the 17th of April, I was uh, at the Finnish ambassador's residence in connection with uh, the visit of a delegation led by a Finnish minister and I suggested to her that we organize an event uh, uh, focused on uh, relations between India and the Nordic countries and how they have evolved so far and what is the way forward. And uh, she very readily agreed. Not only did she agree very readily, but she also said that she'll be happy to coordinate with the other uh, uh, ambassadors, Nordic ambassadors, to have a, a good date, convenient date for each and every one of us. And I'm particularly thankful to her that uh, she was able to do all this task and that is how all of us are here. Uh, friends, the uh, theme of the evening is a partnership between India and the five Nordic uh, countries. Uh, the theme is uh, very vast. The time available is uh, rather limited. I have apportioned about uh, eight minutes uh, to each and every speaker, including myself in my introductory remarks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just flag a few issues as we go forward. And uh, uh, for information of our uh, uh, distinguished audience and also uh, see how we take the discussions after the presentations by our speakers. So first of all, as far as the Nordic, the five Nordic countries are concerned, and we have uh, uh, starting from uh, Sweden, uh, uh, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, and Finland, these five uh, Nordic countries, these, like India, are uh, robust, are stable, are vibrant democracies. Uh, all of us ascribe, all these countries ascribe to the rule of law, to freedom of expression, of uh, uh, freedom of speech, uh, media, social justice, equality, liberty, all these values are common to India and to all these five uh, 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 Nordic countries. Hence, relations between the two countries over the last several decades, over a long period, have been growing uh, well, have been expanding well, have been progressing uh, quite impressively. But uh, that having been said, the relationship has really, the partnership has not been able to realize the full potential that exists. And uh, the premise with which uh, this uh, uh, seminar has been organized and the premise that I'm going to take forward is that so far there has been a convergence of values as far as India and these uh, countries are concerned. Today we are at such a stage that we see that there is a convergence not only of values but also of uh, interests and also of uh, aspirations. 
and this is uh, true not only in the area of uh, trade not only in the area of uh, investment not only in the area of uh, economy economic partnership between the two countries but over a much broader and a much uh, vaster area of uh, cooperation and vaster area of uh, uh, of uh, 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 collaboration between uh, our countries if you look at the nordic countries the five nordic states in terms of population they are not very large the total population of the five countries is about 27 million which is just a shade above the population of the uh, national capital region of delhi uh, I'm sure all, many of us have seen on uh, mm -hmm. uh, T1 uh, airport terminal where they say that uh, this airport handles more than the population of Sweden every year because more than 9 million people uh, go through the uh, T1 uh, uh, airport every year. So the population of uh, all these countries put together is rather small, but that not notwithstanding, in several areas of human activities and human endeavor, these countries have uh, excelled. These countries have uh, exhibited them extremely creditably, whether it is in the, in the area of uh, uh, global ICT rankings, whether it is in the area of global innovation index, global competitiveness ranking, intellectual capitals of the world, most respected nations when there is a branding of countries all these five nordic states uh, appear in the top 10 or top uh, 15 countries so notwithstanding the fact that uh, uh, population is small they are doing extremely well and uh, what really identifies them what really makes them stand out as uh, uh, countries are uh, uh, are advances that they have made in a large number of areas and I could just name a few of them whether it is uh, innovation whether it is uh, green energy whether it is clean technology whether it is manufacturing uh, these are whether it is uh, constructing smart cities building smart cities uh, whether it is uh, uh, waste management or conversion of waste to energy there are a range of uh, themes, there are a range of areas where they have done extremely well. Uh, if we... Good, so now I think I can hurry up because we have the uh, Finnish ambassador here with us. Welcome, welcome, ma'am. <coughs> Madam Ambassador, when you were not here, I extended a particular uh vote of appreciation and gratitude to you for all the help and support you extended in putting this event together and i'm so very happy that you've come what i have said is in terms of the advances and in terms of uh, the accomplishments and successes that uh, nordic countries have uh, been able to make in a large number of areas and as far as india is concerned today also it is a large economy if we look at uh, the purchasing power parity figures, it's a $9.5 trillion economy, is the third largest economy in the world. It is uh, the fastest growing major economy with more than 7% GDP growth over the last uh, several years. In terms of foreign direct investment, in terms of uh, remittances, this uh, the country has been doing extremely well. There is a, a strong, bold political leadership in the country. Uh, a number of new economic initiatives like the goods and sales tax, they have been uh, uh, introduced. There have been a number of uh, flagship initiative programs that have been undertaken. So all this spells extremely uh, happily, extremely well for the relationship as we move forward. But that having been said, it is not only in the area of economy, it's not only in the area of trade and investment that the, there is a huge potential for the countries to work together. But in addition to that, there are areas uh, encompassing from security, from defense, from dealing with the terrorism, dealing with the radicalization, uh, several challenges that afflict the international community today 
these are the challenges that nordic countries and india confront and they can cooperate and collaborate to deal with them so with these a few words saying what is the potential that lies ahead the fact that we have still not been able to realize the potential but i think the discussions today should throw some light on uh, where we are today and what can we do going forward to uh, realize the full uh, possibilities of this bilateral partnership uh, with these uh, words i will uh, invite uh, my uh, panelists and i would request them of course they can uh, cover any subject uh, on the bilateral uh, relations that they would like to but uh, i would appreciate it if they could address themselves to what is the current status of relationship between their countries and india or between let's say the nordic as a block the nordic countries as a block with india and what could be done to bring this relationship to the next higher level so let me first introduce uh, uh, and invite my first uh, speaker that is ambassador nina waskunlati ambassador of finland madam you have the floor and i think you have a powerpoint presentation to make also i invite you to the podium Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The compound, and I, as you can see, I'm, I'm sighing, sighing, sighing. Uh, I, I left the others to to discuss the future and uh, decided to spend a more interesting afternoon or evening here with you. Um, thank you very much for having all of us here and organizing this event and I'm happy to see uh, the house full. And indeed it's a very opportune time to talk about India and the five Nordic countries because maybe Ambassador mentioned uh, only a couple of weeks ago in uh, April we had the first ever uh, India uh, Nordic Innovation Summit which took place in Stockholm and that was preceded and followed by bilateral meetings between all the five Nordic Prime Ministers and Indian uh, Prime Minister. And uh, that, I already think, was something that uh, took our relationship to a uh, next level. And, uh, and all of us, I think we, we have, a, have a roadmap, you know, uh, uh, as, as a Nordic countries and as individual countries with India, showing the way forward. But uh, before going any further, um, there is, uh, it's more interesting only not to listen, but to watch. That's a, a short video clip I wanted to start with. Welcome to the Nordics. So you'll look at that, and then you get an idea what we are all about. No, Ritza, can you please? Because I think I haven't been able to do this myself. <laughs> yeah. works even though we had what? we have been preparing this for two hours in advance but I mean that's the way it goes talking talking about innovation and uh, and you know next level and uh, how we find solutions that function I can't see anything functioning here at the moment yes so um, that's a reality we have to bear with but uh, I assume we have to be innovative which means <laughs> Artificial intelligence, it will soon replace me as well. You see a sort of a, not a real ambassador, but sort of talking head standing, standing here. Some technical problem, yes. The introduction to all of us. So therefore I wanted to do it, because it's about all five of us, not only about me, me. <laughs> We think so. Because there is a certain Nordic perspective on life which can be found all over the world as traces of North. Physically, these traces embody themselves as design, art, and technology. Mentally, as ideas, policies, and human values. There are indeed traces of North everywhere. 
But they're not our sole property. Just as no one can take patent on trust and equality, traces of North are our mutual legacy about where we come from and how to proceed from here. Because this is all about inviting, inspiring, and starting conversations. all this nice and loaded on a stick which worked well at the embassy but here somehow we had to sort of download upload it into the system and therefore we are in the situation where we are at the moment but anyway that was a bit of an idea what the Nordics are, are all about and uh, now if it works out I would have five slides of Finland which are, are here just tell me this way all right here here you can can see uh, sort of a a nice version of a map of Finland. Um, a small, big country up in, in up in, the, in in northern Europe, 1,100 kilometers from the southernmost point to the northernmost point, 1,300 kilometers border with Russia, and a border that uh, functions very well. They were neighboring uh, Norway and, and Sweden uh, uh, in the in the west. 80 um, percent of Finland is forest. 10% of Finland is uh, water, and we live basically on 10%. And uh, in, in spite of uh, being an um, innovated, innovating country uh, and being in the 21st century, um, uh, wood, pulp and paper are still our biggest exports. But since we have uh, become also more modern, we don't, call on them, we don't call them only wood, pulp and paper, but we talk about bioeconomy which covers already 16% of uh, Finnish, uh, Finnish economy. Here, you know, it's just a Finland gateway between East and West. I just wanted to show that how close not only Finland, but all the Nordics are to, to India. Uh, if you talk about uh, Helsinki, it takes you seven hours to fly here. Uh, Stockholm, you add 45 minutes. Copenhagen, you add one hour. Iceland, I think you add two or three hours, but soon they will have their own direct airline. So uh, do they, they don't even have to, uh, they can do it all the way, like they can do in Stockholm and, and, and Copenhagen as well. A uh, few facts, 5.5 uh, million small population, um, that always surprises people in, uh, in India. Uh, it's for Sonakapuri and a bit, and that is whole Finland. Uh, Helsinki, the capital, neighbors I mentioned, independence, we became independent in 1917. Um, multi-party democracy, member of the European Union since 1995, and we have a staunch member of the European Union, and, and, and believe that as, be, as part of the EU, we are stronger than we would be otherwise. Currency, Euro, uh, corporate tax rate, we always uh, advertise that nowadays, only 20%, indicating that Finland is a very, also a very attractive uh, uh, investment uh, destination. And this I always laugh when I see it, business languages, Finnish, English, and Swedish. Finnish and Swedish are the official languages of Finland. English is a language that is taught to everybody at school, and on top of that you normally learn another two or, or three, another two, two languages. Some international rankings, um, uh, every time I see a ranking and when I see Finland or being on the top, I feel a bit worried because uh, I wonder how long we are going to stay on the top. It takes hard work to get on the, to the top, but it takes even harder work to stay on the on the top because uh, you, you can't you, you can fall pretty quickly. But uh, but the, these are also sort of uh, our assets. I would say uh, uh, university industry research collaboration, good primary education, good business environment. Um, best in the world in innovation. I don't know. I mean, I think we can all be, we can all claim to be the best in innovation, depending which kind of innovation you are, you're thinking of. Um, we, we try to innovate areas that are sort of, a, would sort of ease people's everyday, everyday life. The most stable country in the world, but I think when I talk about my fellow Nordics, I think we are all pretty stable. So I think you could have all five of us in, in, in that, uh, in that, uh, in that ranking. And, uh, uh, before I finish, uh, we will, uh, I'll show you another, another little video that uh, gives you an idea of what uh, all five are striving for at the moment. 
um, Ambassador was asking uh, to give a sort of a, an idea of state of play between India and, and Finland. Um, well, good political relationship, good economic relationship, no problems whatsoever. And uh, next year, 2019, we will be celebrating the 70th anniversary of, of diplomatic relations between India and, uh, and, and Finland. Um, sometimes I say the relationship is a bit thin. We could do more. And, and therefore, like I'm standing with here, you tonight, sort of uh, together with my Nordic colleagues doing a bit of a promotion, promotion uh, for, for our countries because we have ideas to share, we have solutions to share, we have uh, goods to trade with you, and there are companies that are keen in investing in, in, uh, in, in, in India. But before I, I stop, I think I, I, so I will stop here and uh, I'll show you another little video clip where all the five Nordic prime ministers uh, will shine. Planning a sustainable future is a good idea for so many reasons. In the Nordic countries, we have focused on building sustainable cities that are safe and livable, also for our children. Public spaces where we all can live, move and play, and where smart climate solutions are an integral part of our urban planning. We face many different challenges, and we believe that we're stronger together. All the Nordic countries have a vision and concrete plans to become fossil free. Moving to the green energy will boost the economy. Our common electricity market will also help to reach a target. We need to push green transition even more. There is simply no time to waste. For the sake of the planet, it's important that as many people as possible, as early as possible, acknowledge all of the changes we need to make. It's important for the climate, humankind and our planet. The Nordic countries want to provide well-being for everyone, independently of age and background. We are eager to share and develop our welfare innovations. When it comes to making our food systems more sustainable, we see food as a powerful catalyst for climate action as well. To maintain this level of welfare, we all need to play a part, at home and at work. Gender equality in the labor market is a hallmark for the Nordic countries and has enabled us to become one of the most prosperous regions in the world. Policies promoting equal opportunities for both women and men in working life are essential. Affordable childcare, education, and parental leave for both parents have increased our country's growth and well-being. There are countless reasons to act. We want to share what the Nordic countries have learned with the rest of the world. The Prime Ministers of Nordic countries want to bring Nordic solutions to global challenges. With this joint initiative, we want to invite the world to share knowledge of three priority themes. Nordic Green, Nordic Gender Effect and Nordic Food and Welfare. These Nordic solutions will be effective tools in our common work to reach United Nations Sustainable Goals before the year 2030. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for an excellent uh, presentation and an excellent uh, video. I think uh, the audience has got a 
fair idea, brief idea of uh, what the Nordics together uh, stand for in terms of uh, gender equality, women empowerment, uh, justice, liberty, uh, green solutions, innovation, etc. Uh, and I think uh, going forward after the presentations from all our uh, panelists have been made, we will have a discussion also on uh, how can we achieve the higher levels of uh, uh, partnership and engagement between India and the no Nordic countries, either bilaterally or jointly together. So let me turn now to the next speaker, that is Ambassador Peter Taksoy Janssen from uh, Denmark. And uh, you have the floor and you have also up to eight minutes. Does this work over here? Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, let me start by, by thanking Nina for taking the initiative <coughs> together with, uh, with our host and giving us an opportunity to talk about something I, I think is actually really important. I think I, I have the feeling that uh, Ambassador Satyanja s stole some of my thunder by, by saying things. I have a couple of things I wanted to add. I mean, India is the fifth largest economy in the world. The Nordics, if you put them together, is the 11th largest economy in the world. And we are, as was stated, only 27 million people. Um, there was another important thing you forgot, which is that we have three Nordic countries at the World Cup and uh, two qualified to the next stage, and who knows whether Sweden and Denmark <laughs> is going to, to meet in the finals. We'll have to see about that. Um, we have had many, many matches between our two countries. They are always fun. I'll try to answer, the, I have a long speech, but I actually rather think I'll try to answer the three questions uh, that you raised, Ambassador. First of all, the status of bilateral relations uh, between uh, Denmark and India. We can brag to be the Nordic country which have the longest bilateral relationship with, with India. It goes back 390, 18, 398 years now, because the first Danes arrived here in, uh, in 1620 and established relations. Uh, and we have enjoyed very, very good relations with India until 2011, where we had what I call a blob in our bilateral relationship because of an extradition case I think you all know about. And I would say that could not come at a worse time uh, if you think about it, because at the same time as this happened, we are seeing as you all know, uh, a very, very rapidly changing world where new ties have to be built uh, and where at the same time we have the feeling that the train is leaving the station here in India. You have embarked on this amazing journey towards becoming a, the second largest economy in the world but also a modern state. Uh, and uh, in a situation like that, in a situation where you see the economic epicenter moving so rapidly from the west to the east, you want to build bridges, and when you have a broken bridge, you really need to mend it quickly. And we're working hard to do that from a situation where there was uh, no government to government contact in 2011 12 to a situation now where I can happily report that we are back on track, but we have lost some years, uh, and uh, we're working to catch up with our Nordic friends and others uh, in order for us to be able to unleash the potential I believe we see in the bilateral relationship between India and Denmark, but also in the Nordic uh, Indo, Indo relationship, which I, I'm going to talk about. As was mentioned, uh, the Nordic Prime Minister has met with your Prime Minister in Stockholm in seven, in, on the 17th of April. There was also bilateral me meetings there. After that meeting, my uh, Prime Minister could report to Danish public media that after having been, been in the deep freezer and moved into the fridge and we were on the vegetable shelf, now we are out in the free air and we're waiting to move, into the oven. move into the oven, exactly, that was his expression. Uh, so my task is to actually find the uh, gateway to the oven uh, and I'm working hard to do that. No, so we are back on track, but we want to do the other Asian countries with uh, Japan, with Indonesia, with Vietnam, with China to build a strategic partnership where we can unleash all the different uh, potentials that we see in our bilateral uh, relationship. Then you ask about the Nordic-Indo uh, relationship and I think one thing that we need to, to be aware of is that we are 
five close uh, Nordic countries. We, have, we are also competitors in some areas, and, and we have to identify the areas where we can actually work together to build the relationship between uh, India and, and the Nordic countries. I think I was at the meeting with between the uh, six prime ministers in, in, in Stockholm, and I, I can report that that meeting actually came off to a good start for a new phase in Nordic Indo uh, relationship. But I think we need to do more, and I think that is coming to your third question, uh, because we need to, in a way, try to identify what, what are the areas where we really can see added value in a Nordic Indo uh, interrelationship uh, that is not sort of standing in the way of the bilateral relationships that we are all building. <laughs> And I think the Prime Minister has actually identified some, and some are, are sort of moving rapidly up the agenda. As I started saying, we, we, we were losing, as Denmark, time with India, because times they are changing. We can all see what is happening with the world order as we knew it. We are going to face a very, very different world order uh, going forward. Uh, I was serving, before I came here, three years ago in the US, and I felt like moving from the past to the future, to be honest, and that has been reinforced by what has happened uh, since. Um, and what we need to start thinking about is what is what kind of a world do we want to build together, and who are the partners that we can build this world, world with? And here I think there's a lot a lot that Denmark, sorry, the Nordic countries and, and India can do together. <coughs> the ambassador also already started sort of the, the foundation for this collaboration, which is the values. And I, I very much agree that that is going to be uh, sort of the whole foundation of taking the Nordic uh, Indo uh, collaboration forward. It was already mentioned in the, in the video that one sort of frame to, uh, to have for international collaboration was identified back in 2015 where world leaders identified the sustainable development goals. Uh, all Nordic countries are pursuing them rigorously and I think that is very and a very important framework also for the uh, collaboration with India. I think Bill Gates has said and your Minister for Urban Development has said that for them to succeed, India needs to succeed. And we want India to see, succeed, but we also want the development goals to succeed. They cover uh, the whole range of societies, and if you, if you look at them, and I'm not bragging now, many of those goals, even though we have homework to do in the Nordic countries, are very close to societies like the ones you have uh, in the Nordic countries, equality, uh, no uh, poverty, and you can go through all the goals and you will see that we are actually quite close to achieving them. But we are also willing to do what we can in order to share. So that's one area. Climate change is another one which has uh, developed uh, rapidly after the Paris Agreement and the events where the Americans uh, left that. Here uh, it, it covers sort of a situation where we need to work together with India and now India has taken a leadership role uh, on this uh, agenda and we want to do that. All Nordic countries are in the forefront when it comes to greening our economies and we have a lot to deliver here, but we also can provide something at the global level and that is an area where I think we can uh, work together. Then coming back to, to the values, I think in the multilateral system, when I was at the UN 10 years ago, India was still sort of in a, in a different uh, setting and a different grouping. I think that has changed extremely rapidly now. We, uh, all Nordic uh, countries, support India's uh, right place in the multilateral order. We all support India as a permanent member of the Security Council. We all support India <coughs> becoming uh, a voice in all the different fora where we are working together. And I think in that framework, we also need to step up our collaboration because after all, we are benefiting and India will be benefiting from and are benefiting from the multilateral system that we have had and has been has made our international engagement much more foreseeable than it was before 1945. So we have an interest to adjust and modernize the system, ensure that those new growing powers find their right place in that order, but also build relations based on these uh, values together uh, so that we can preserve and modernize the international order to the benefit of the Nordic countries because we are all multilateralist uh, approaches. We are, if you look at statistics, 
the citizens of the Nordic countries actually are those most supportive of the United Nations, so we don't have to have an argument about whether that makes sense or not. It makes sense for everybody. We also, everybody agrees that it has to, to be modernized. And the final thing I would say is the, uh, the security agenda, which you cannot avoid. And here I think there's big scope for collaboration. India has been marred with terrorism for many, many years. Uh, we have seen that in Europe as well, in my own home city. Uh, and that is also an area, terrorism, naval security, other areas where collaboration could be stepped up. And I'll stop now, but just with some ideas on how to take it forward. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I mentioned uh, eight minutes, but you are such a compelling speaker that I didn't want to interrupt when you were speaking. A little more, a little more, but that's all right. That's all right. I think you covered quite a lot of ground, and uh, I, th <laughs> I knew that. I th I'm sure everyone has lots of other points, and that's why I said, you know, the subject is vast, but the time is limited, and we really have to. And uh, after the, all the presentations by the panelists are made, I would like to have a conversation with the panel here, and then I would definitely like a little time to, uh, for the floor to be open for comments and questions. Because as we can see, there is such a huge interest, and that is proven by the large number of people who are here. And I'm sure they also want to have their say. So I will uh, move uh, from here now to Ambassador Thorer Ibsen from Iceland. And uh, you had mentioned that uh, I had sent eight minutes. You said you'll be shorter. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so I, I, I'll give the floor to you. You can sit here and, oh, you have some slides. You have slides. Okay. Uh, good evening uh, or good afternoon, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it's interesting uh, to start maybe with the point about the, the Indo-Nordic relations, especially in the light that we just had the, the uh, summit, Indo-Nordic summit in Stockholm. And uh, uh, when it comes to the relationship of the Nordics to, the, to India, it is, it, it is interwoven in a complex web of different uh, com uh, competences that we can bring to India from the different Nordics that I'm going to address more specifically in relation to Iceland later. But my colleague Peter, he mentioned that uh, Denmark has the oldest connection with India. That's correct. But they, Denmark already brought both Norway and Iceland down to India in 1620. Danish crown was then linked to the Norwegian crown. And falling under the Nor Danish crown was a small island in the North West Atlantic called Iceland. And a young man there, a dreamer, came to, to Copenhagen and became a gunner on a, a naval ship of the, the, the Danish king, sailed all the way down to Trankibar in 1622, had to leave in 1624, unfortunately because of an accident with a gun. But when he became 60, he wrote a book, a travelogue, about his experience of, of southwest, uh, Southeast India. And that book is still an authority, and you can find it on the Amazon in a Kindle version if you want to read uh, how uh, uh, Nordics viewed India and Indian society in the late, in, in, late, in the 17th century. But coming to Iceland, uh, we are the, the smallest one of them all. And, but here again, size is something relative. Mentioned uh, uh, Delhi, 23, 24 million people here is mind-boggling for an Icelander to come into that kind of a society. Not only is it a big country, but the city you're living is huge. But everything is relative. Uh, Iceland isn't that small a country. It is 103,000 square kilometers. That means with the size of Bihar. Not a small country, but they have the winning when it comes to the population. They are 114 million, and we are 330,000, so they have a bit of advantage there. Now, the makeup of Iceland in terms of uh, its economy, it's an open market economy, like the Nordic, it's an affluent society, wealth of society. But here again, it's interesting when you're dealing with the Nordic to keep in mind that we also have a different economic structure. We share values. We share approaches, we share uh, desire for innovation and technology and development and sustainability, 
but we don't all have the same economic structure. So Iceland is a resource-based economy. Uh, and the, uh, we base, have always based our living of using our renewable resources. Fisheries, number one. Second, renewable energy. Third, just the land itself for tourism. But in order to get that high level of development and that high uh, 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 fast uh, economic growth that we've been having in our countries, it's not enough to have these resources. You have to have well-educated mm -hmm. and well-trained, skilled people to use these resources. And you have to put a lot of effort in technological innovation to develop the use of these resources. And that's what unites the Nordics, is not necessarily what we have and what is given to us by nature, but our aspiration to do the best of using these resources in a different fashion by, by innovation and development. And I bring that up in the context of Indo-Nordic relations, smart, because smart cities was mentioned here earlier, and we are now starting a, 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 a pilot project uh, with uh, uh, Nordic Innovation, two years program of seeing how we can bring uh, the technology and knowledge from the Nordic countries in the development of, of the smart cities uh, uh, project in India. Now, to brag a bit about specifically about the Icelandic economy and society, uh, uh, gender is, is something very important to us. We have, uh, uh, have the, 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 the number one on the closer the gender gap uh, for, uh, I, I, I've lost the count of it. I think it's the eighth or the ninth consecutive year that we're number on that, one on that list. And secondly, we're the most peaceful country. And thirdly, we're the fastest growing economy in Europe. Specifically about Iceland. Uh, important to keep in mind that India is not a conventional or traditional market for Iceland. Why do I say that? I mentioned earlier that we are a resource-based economy. And we will make a lot of value out of fish, and we export fish. But we don't export much fish, hardly any fish to, to, to India. Secondly, we export uh, energy by importing energy intensive industry into the country and re-export aluminium. That doesn't come to India either. So two of the biggest sectors are not working here at all. But the fastest growing sector between India and Iceland is in the area of tourism. The people-to-people -people connection is very important and fast growing. Uh, not so much in absolute term. We receive two million tourists a year in Iceland. The share of India is still far too small. But when I came here four years back, 315 visas were issued per year. Now we are closing in somewhere between this year predicted seven to eight thousand visas will be this year so that that is the the pace of the growth uh, of of interest of india in iceland and it's going to be more because in december we're going to offer you all a direct flight between delhi and iceland the first flight is leaving 7th of december you better be quick to go on the web and book yourself in Lovely, absolutely lovely. <laughs> my, my colleague Neil and he showed the Northern Lights. That's the best time to come and see the Northern Lights and the Nordic Dilvali because that's the Christmas season when we have the same side of a light and, 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 and fireworks that you have during Dilvali. I promise to be brief and I just want to emphasize the point that what we are seeking here, apart from the tourist connection and the film connection that's been very important, India has turned out to be more a high-tech market for us than a traditional market of resources. Uh, uh, food processing uh, technology, high-tech industry, that's what we, we, we are selling here on the market. Uh, medical equipment like prosthetics, uh, biotechnology, uh, apart from the IT sector. So that's a new layer. So that's and the renewable energy technology, of course, we are 90% renewable, so this is where we want to go with India in the future. And uh, I will leave it there, give you opportunity to ask me later. I'm probably shorter than eight minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. You just about made it to eight minutes, and I appreciate that.
let me now turn to Gautam, Gautam Bhattacharya from Sweden. He's uh, not only representing his country, but he's also been in the private sector. So I think he can give us uh, an idea of uh, what the opportunities are in possibly in greater detail, but up to eight minutes. Esteemed colleagues, greetings from my ambassador club. A long experience of, for example, passport free travel. I don't know when we started that in the Nordics. 62, thank you, Ambassador. So even before Schengen was born, before, before that idea even was, was on the planning uh, drawing board, uh, we had actually implemented a, a sort of an open and free market in the Nordics, something to be proud of. I'd also like to add that we have three more countries which are semi-attached uh, to us, and, and those are the Baltic countries. They should be mentioned in this, and I think we have representatives from two Baltic countries in the audience here, Latvia and Lithuania, it should be mentioned that they are also part of, a, of, of our circle nowadays. Uh, so talking about Sweden, uh, it is in the center of the Nordics, therefore we also attract both criticism and, and uh, envy from our neighbors. We are the big brother, uh, much like perhaps India in Sark, and I think that's one area where India and, and the South Asian region could look at the Nordics. We have long experience of regional cooperation. I, I, if we talk about what we can do, BIMSTEC, um, BBIN, et cetera, all these initiatives that really need to, to pick up speed. India needs to connect to the so Southeast Asian region and within the region. I think South Asia is the least connected, uh, interconnected region of the world. So I think there we really have some potential to, to work together. Uh, Sweden, 10 million people, again, to draw a parallel, uh, it's, it's less than half of Delhi, one crore, uh, on uh, surface area equivalent to undivided Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh plus Madhya Pradesh. We also have lots of space, forest, lakes, etc. The last famine when people died in, in Sweden was in 1867 in the north. People were eating bark off the trees. Uh, 1867. How long ago was that? Little more than 150 years. Yes, that's where we started from. We got rich through exporting uh, uh, different kinds of grains to England, steel, we have uh, plenty of iron, and slowly over the years, uh, com uh, you know, uh, universal education in the 1850s and 60s, Sweden and the Nordics managed to turn their advantage and do whatever resources we had in that harsh climate in the North, we managed through innovation and through hard work to create fantastic companies. And some of those companies came here already in, in the, the beginning of the 20th century. So we had Ericsson, switch, first manual switchboard to deliver to India in 1903. ABB, SKF, Swedish Match, became the largest match company in India, and uh, it went on. And in about two weeks' time, the Swedish furniture company, IKEA, will now start terrorizing you with very, very economic products for your homes. And we all hope you'll go and shop there uh, in Hyderabad and then spreading out all over the country. So again, uh, from, from those beginnings with Ericsson in 1903 to IKEA today, it's been a really long, long uh, road. And I'll now just bore you with a few facts. Uh, and this is really what we have done invested $2.9 billion total investments. In the last three years, 1.5 billion of those, 2.9, is picking up like this. Planned investments, 1.1 billion. We employ about two lakh people today uh, in, in India, Swedish company, the largest 25 companies. 1.6 million indirect jobs through suppliers and supply chains. And 7,700 engineering and R&D jobs, which is quite a lot for a country like Sweden. Trade in goods and services increasing, admittedly, India is still only market number 19 or 20 in terms of exports for us, and we are somewhere on the same lines for you. So trade could increase uh, in, in goods especially, but there is a reason to it also. That's that the Swedish companies have been very good in transferring their um, production to India. There's really less need today to transport Volvo trucks or, or, or parts from, for, for the Swedish companies to India. They manufacture here, I'll come back to that. Services is also growing. Um, Indian IT engineers were the largest single category of uh, work permit uh, uh, receivers uh, in Sweden, 4,800 last year. So uh, Indian IT has also made its mark in Sweden. Uh, about 70 Indian companies are represented in, in Sweden, mostly in the IT sector. Sweden is the number 12 FDI partner to India between, in the last 17 years, way behind Japan, US, UK, and Germany, which are the four, four uh, to, to the right. Uh, but uh, still quite a significant uh, amount. And 
according to the government of India, DIPP itself, we are uh, number five in Make in India. You see some of the brands that we have there, ABB, Ericsson, household names in India and the world. And uh, that's really been the story of the last few years, that we have gone from, from uh, manufacturing to retail and nowadays to Spotify, Skype, Truecaller, 100 million customers. India is the biggest market for Truecaller. So you can see that the tech sector is also coming in. So we, we see a lot of scope uh, between our countries. And um, coming back then finally to, to what, what, uh, what really can be, uh, be shown on, on the bilateral agenda. I'll just give you two, one, one example. In Pune, we have a cluster of companies, uh, about five or 10 of them in a small place called Pimpri Chinchwad. And it's called Svianagar, the city of Sweden. We have a project there called Kraft Samla, which really is that the Swedish companies and the Chamber of Commerce together with the government of Maharashtra have joined together <laughs> to skill women in non-traditional uh, roles, welding, truck driving, uh, forklifting, uh, electricians, plumbers, etc. So this is a whole new concept that's never been done in India. We were trying to bring women into non-traditional sectors and increase the participation of women in the labor force. Just one small example. Uh, innovation, innovation is the key. Uh, we have interests in defense, in biotech, in, in um, various sectors. And what uh, really unites all our companies is, if you see the green bar, is the, the perception of India as a favor favorable country to do business in. And it's from 2013, 14, 15, 16. You can see that it's becoming more and more positive. And the figures for 17 are even better. So our companies, about 200 of them, are really looking at India with, with great uh, um, you know, conviction. They are reinvesting the money here. And um, if we only can get the Nobel Prize in Literature in order, I think we'll, we'll be happy if the Nobel Committee can get its act together and, and give some prizes next year. Otherwise, we are really looking forward to joint collaboration with India. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, for this very informative presentation. Now we have the last presentation of the evening from our panelists, Ms. Hanne Meldegard from uh, Norway. And uh, you also have up to 10, uh, up to eight minutes. Sorry, that was not a Freudian slip. <laughs> up to eight minutes. And uh, I would appreciate if you can uh, uh, complete your presentation within that time, because then I would like to have some interaction with the audience also. I Thank you. You are well placed to do that. <laughs> You know, uh, since I'm the last uh, speaker, I will not answer the question that was asked because they have been, uh, been answered already. I will uh, answer a question that might not have been asked, and that is, what is cooking? That's what my Swedish big brother over here told me <laughs> today. Uh, yes, we are smaller than you. We are 5.5 millions. Uh, but you know that, Gaut Gautam, that if you look at the sea and the area we are governed around Svalbard, we are the world's 10th biggest country. Oh, I love to say that. <laughs> so uh, so um, uh, we are also resource-based, uh, oil and fish. Um, but we are not in the soccer game. And uh, I think we normally we win the ski contest that we have. Normally we do that. But I think if Sweden should get up and get one of those three prizes, you know, there will be no friendship for a long, long time. <laughs> so what's cooking? I'm uh, coming back to that. But first I will say that what's cooking is what uh, Iceland said as well. It's the visa section. The visa section in the embassy is very cooking. And sometimes I want to ask Indians not to go because it really costs us a lot of trouble. We are, uh, we are increasing 20 percent every year. So we used to be an embassy with a visa section and now we're becoming a visa section with an embassy. <laughs> so, um, but I'm glad you like Norway, but you know, we have pictures. I want to say just a few numbers of uh, uh, we have before I go into what cooking. And that is uh, for, uh, for the business here. We have uh, more than 100 uh, businesses here. And that is more than the double just since 2013. Most of them, like two-thirds of them, are in maritime or uh, marine sector. So uh, the fisheries and our experience there is, of course, reflecting in what uh, the companies want to do here in India. They say that that is about 15,000 people who are uh, working for Norwegian companies or giving work. They are giving work to 15,000 people. That's not very much in India, but still. And then we have, uh, I have to mention the pension fund because they have invested uh, more than $10 billion in uh, 
and and I cannot you know I cannot influence them. So don't ask me to <laughs> to make them to invest because uh, they do them do that by themselves. Uh, we had a trade yesterday uh, no, last year for 6.3 billions, and that's not very much. But I think what was said here is also because you can't really uh, measure trade anymore as we used to do because it doesn't whoops, cross the border that much anymore. So um, we are doing fine. We are going that way that we should. And we see that is interest for our, for our um, uh, knowledge and also from Norway to go to India to get the knowledge that you have here. So what's cooking? What do I want to speak about? How many minutes do I have? Uh, two. Ah, come on. <laughs> I do not. No, I want to speak about the ocean because the ocean is, uh, is uh, actually cooking. It's boiling, and that's the sad news. Uh, India or the Indian Ocean is 20% of the world's seas, and it's boiling here and other places as well. This is where we have to get our food. This is where we are going to see that business is made, that resources are taking. But the way we are treating the ocean now is really, um, well, you can invent that word yourself. You know, and what, we, what happened in Stockholm, and we've been working for that for two years because our uh, prime minister launched uh, a white paper about the oceans uh, one and a half, two years ago, and also a high-level panel for the oceans. Uh, that is becoming global now. And this is, uh, it's picking up around the globe. And what's really nice to tell you is that this is also picking up in India. And I think, uh, you know, it hasn't been that much awareness. It's a long way from Delhi and down to the Bengal uh, bay where you have a dead zone of 60,000 square kilometers. That means that nothing is living in that uh, that area. And with the fisheries going down, you are the third biggest fishery nation in the world. Aquaculture culture is li really going up here. But at the same time, the spices that you ca can get, it's getting down, down, down the chain. So sardines is mostly what you get now. This is really important. And I think that we have you know, this, this is a common goal for all of us. And you have resources, you have the, uh, not, not, not uh, what you call this, the intellectual... Um, um, uh, uh, yeah, oh, hmm, I forgot. Uh, anyway, but we have the resources on the research uh, field, you have a lot of uh, practical uh, common sense to do with this, and we have also this, uh, this uh, experience, we can... We can uh, work together on a lot of things that will take the waste away from the rivers at least, because I don't think we can take it away from the oceans. And India will become one of the 10 countries, who in five years you will become one of the 10 countries who is putting most waste out in the ocean. Something has to be done. And you know, I can feel that I'm really, this is something I really burn for. I'm cooking for this as well, because it's something about all of us. So I had a plan in this speech to end this. Yeah, and that was to be proud of myself, actually, or of us as governments. Because what we know is that the way the governments are pointing, the researchers are going. They need money too. So where we put our money in research, in development, in innovation, that's the way the world goes. And therefore, we have to make sure that we are putting our money and our efforts in the right direction for what needs to be done if this uh, goal number 17 and all the others should be achieved. So, be proud, thank just do it. Well, thank you very much. I think each and every one of our speakers has uh, added uh, to our uh, knowledge, to our information. I do not have the time, basically, to summarize or to call out what were the significant points, but I think all of us who are here have been able to draw on many of these uh, points. Uh, of course, when the last speaker was talking about what is uh, cooking, I thought at one stage she would also say salmon, because I'm sure if she had said that, that would have gladdened the hearts of many of the people here. Although there might have been some contenders, competitors as to where the best salmon comes from, from the Nordic countries. That is, I think, not a, not a theme that unites, uh, unites uh, the Nordic countries. But uh, that notwithstanding, you know, let me, let me ask uh, two uh, uh, questions, and I will throw it open to the panel here, you might uh, take, uh, each and every one of you could respond or whoever wishes to. And after that, I will throw the floor, uh, uh, throw, the, uh, throw it to the uh, audience to make their comments, uh, uh, ask questions. So uh, the question I have is, you know, the uh, 
Danish ambassador, you uh, sir mentioned uh, Ambassador Jensen, that uh, uh, the Nordic countries are supportive of uh, India's uh, membership of the UN uh, Security, permanent membership of the UN Security Council. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, you know, it does, uh, the joint statement that emanated on the 17th of April from Stockholm, uh, the joint statement with Sweden definitely mentions both on NSG and on UNSC that uh, Sweden is supportive of permanent membership, Sweden is supportive of India's membership of uh, NSG. But as far as the joint statement with the Nordic countries is concerned, it is more hedged and more guarded. It is not uh, an unambiguous uh, 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 acceptance and uh, uh, support of uh, this position. So that is number one, if you could speak. The second uh, question I have is, you know, as you mentioned, a number of uh, uh, flagship initiatives have been taken in India. Make in India was mentioned by Gotham. Some others mentioned smart cities. Some others uh, mentioned uh, Skill India, Startup India, Digital India. So what has been the uh, collaboration of the different countries as far as these flagship initiatives are concerned? Of course, we do know, uh, Gautam, you mentioned Ericsson has been here from 1903 and so on and so forth. So you can't really say that that, that is evidence of uh, success of the Make in India program because these are things that have been happening already for a long, long time. But over the last four years or so, these initiatives that have come about, what has been the success going forward? How uh, have uh, investments and in terms of production, jobs, exports, how have they been reflected? So let me start uh, uh, with... Uh, uh, maybe you, Ambassador Nina Vaskalanti, if you can uh, respond to any of these uh, or both these questions, and we can then go move forward. Thank you, Thank you Ambassador. Um, before answering the question, I mean, I have to say one thing that I forgot. I heard my colleagues talking about uh, the uh, of, uh, companies operating uh, um, Finland as well. There are roughly 100 Finnish companies that are active in India. And the figure is um, growing, but slowly. And here I quite openly have to say that uh, even though India offers lots of opportunities and possibilities, the Indian market is also very challenging. And this is something that was discussed between the five Nordic Prime Ministers and Indian Prime Minister in Stockholm. And um, if, if and when, when India wants to prosper, and your Prime Minister openly said that uh, Nobody can prosper on its own, but prosperity, prosperity comes through collaboration. And we are all ready to do that. But that also means that the uh, environment has to be enabling for that. And we are happy to contribute towards that. Um, uh, concerning flagship initiatives, I can uh, give you one, uh, one or two um, examples, in particular in the field of um, renewable um, energy. Um, there, are, there are a couple of Finnish companies who are investing in, in solar energy in various parts of uh, India. And then also a um, couple of Finnish companies who are very much into uh, electrical vehicles, uh, where be it sort of charging stations or, or, or uh, yeah, uh, uh, charging stations in particular. There are one or two pilots which are already going on in Delhi. Another couple of pilots will be open in Hyderabad in a couple of, in, 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 in 10 days' time. So that is... Uh, a, no, I, I wouldn't call it a contribution because companies don't contribute. Companies uh, are here to make business and to make profit. But uh, um, that, um, uh, let's say, flagship initiative, uh, whether offers many opportunities for the Finnish companies and also surely to the to the others. Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, to you, Ambassador Janssen, would you? Thank you so much. Uh, I will, I will try to answer the first question, which is not so easy. Um, I think there was um, a willingness for all of us to reflect uh, the close relationship between the Nordic countries and uh, India, in also in the areas of multilateralism. But 
there's also politics in this, and there was um, all Nordic countries were pursuing sort of bilateral uh, declarations as well. Uh, Sweden had one. Uh, there was a balance between the Nordic declaration and the Swedish declaration, to be very frank. And I think that is the reason why you see, can we say, this issue uh, reflected differently. Uh, we would have loved to see sort of stronger language on this. Uh, it was also negotiated uh, in a special way, so uh, therefore um, this might be seen as weaker language. I, I don't think that's actually the intention of the governments of, of the five Nordic countries. On the second one, I, I mean flagship initiatives, I, I normally look more look at it as sort of framing some of the challenges that uh, India is facing and the, the, this Modi government has been very good at doing this. Um, we have, uh, in the beginning of my tenure here, focused very much of sort of things we could do decentralized because we didn't have so much collaboration with the center. And so therefore the Smart Cities agenda was one that was easy to move forward. Um, I can report that we managed to actually get a city to city uh, collaboration between Udaipur and a Danish city up and running where you actually have those people who are de dealing with the challenges of clean water and those sitting, talking to people who are dealing with the same issues. And I think that is a very good way to actually uh, try to move this forward instead of trying to approach all these SPVs and sell consultancy hours and other things that are being done at the moment. Making India for, for, Dan for Denmark, we are not number five in this. Um, this is basically a question of attracting investment into India and establishing uh, workplaces in India. Danish companies tend to want to ensure that they actually have a market before they do the investment. So the first step for us is exports and then you can establish yourself as a company in India. We have done that. Uh, we have at 125 companies operating in India. But when you have this agenda uh, and when you at the same time have, can we say, a rather protectionist uh, approach to trade as you have in India, then it becomes difficult to take, take step number two when you haven't taken step number one. And that is a challenge for, for Danish companies to, to come here. I have to be careful to advise who to go here because this is not an easy market to penetrate. And you have to get the right companies to actually come to India to succeed. And you don't want to have companies spending and wasting a lot of time and money uh, without, uh, without thinking about it. So therefore, uh, especially with a, can we say, a business structure in Denmark, which is uh, a lot of small and medium-sized businesses, uh, you have to be careful and think about how they can actually penetrate the market. So uh, that's what I would say about that. Thank you. I think that's very useful. I think both on uh, what the position on of the Nordic countries on India's uh, membership, permanent membership of the UN Security Council, NSG, etc. And also on uh, making India and some of the other uh, uh, initiatives that are being taken. You're very right. Uh, companies will come here. Companies will invest only if they see that it is a good enabling environment. Of course, uh, I'm sure all of uh, us here on the panel and all of us in the audience realize that India has moved from 142nd position to 100th position over the last three years. But of course, 100th position is not something to be proud of. We need, we have to move forward. And I think at least there is recognition that the move is in the right direction and the move currently is taking place at a reasonably rapid pace. So I think uh, that uh, being there, uh, the international community is also responding because India has become the highest uh, uh, foreign direct investment destination over the last two years. So I agree it is challenging, but of course there are, there is great potential also. Ambassador Ibsen, would you? Let me see. Uh, just to add on the first thing about the NSG and the, and the uh, Security Council, I mean, there hasn't been any question about the support of the Nordic countries. You just have to keep in mind when you do press releases, you have to put it in the political context that's taking place in New York. And that, that is what we all have to live with. Uh, there's, there's about your, your candidature, there's always a politics that we have to make sure the language that we put out fits into the dialogue that is taking place during that day. But our support is unwavering. Uh, on the initiatives, the, uh, I think the, 
all, now all these main major initiatives of the, the current government for investment uh, and, and development in India, uh, the Nordics can contribute everywhere. And, uh, and, and have the, we, we do in a different way in a different sectors, depending on what we, what, where we come from. And, and, uh, but here I have to be frank with you. The problem is n not the opportunities. The problem is not the, the lack of will of the Nordics to come in with the technology and with the investment. And certainly we heard from your Prime Minister in Stockholm uh, reaching out to us in different sector, and it was very interesting. He spoke very specifically to each country with a different language what he wanted from each country to come in with. But when you come back here to Delhi and you deal with your bureaucracy, <laughs> need I say more? Well, I think you can pass it to Hanne. Would you? <laughs> well, on the second question, it's um, Norway's. Uh, trying to promote the LNG, very much so. We have uh, in Norway a ferries that goes on uh, LNG, and only two weeks ago we had an uh, aircraft taking off for two persons for a couple of hour hours it could go, so that is the future as well. And, um, and of course renewable energy from uh, ocean, but we haven't gotten very far so far on that. But I wanted to say something you know, about there's no illusion that we are going to make this for you. You are going to do that yourself. If we can help, we are glad. If we can uh, make money on it, that is a good thing and so on. But I wanted to point to one thing in the health sector, which also is a flagship here, is that we had this, uh, this project where we invested in modern technology for uh, this uh, iPad uh, thing for children and, uh, and mothers and how to you know, save children from dying unnecessarily after that, and we invested, well it is some money, it's 10 years now, we invested like 600, uh, is it? Or 60? Yeah, some millions. But the point there is that for each kroner or for each five rupees that we invested, the Indian government had taken over the whole thing and they have invested 175 rupees. And that's the way to go, I think. And then you are doing something that is really making an impact for a lot of women and children. So. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't think I need to come to you, Gautam, because you've spoken about Make in India, you've spoken about, you know, your... Okay, 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 go ahead. Just one, one short comment. Uh, on, on the second issue of the flagship programs, I, I think the, uh, you said, or the Icelandic ambassador said that, uh, yes, Make in India was happening anyway, and it's been happening for a long time. Uh, but I think that we, we do realize the problems with bureaucracy in India. Uh, there, there is a capacity problem, which means that uh, maybe India does not have always the the um, the uh, energy to engage with all regions of the world in the same at the same level. Yes, we we, we accept that. I have to give, for example, the Department of Industrial Promotion uh, (DIPP) uh, and uh, really really uh, kudos to them because they have engaged with us for the last two years on a special mechanism where Swedish companies can contact and through the embassy and the Chamber of Commerce, we can walk straight into the Ministry of Commerce, state our problem, and they will take care of it and get back to us within a certain time frame. This is unheard of, and I, I really want to give, give uh, the Indian government their, uh, you, know, uh, their you know, top marks, top marks for this. And it has really already yielded results. So what I'm saying is that Make in India, maybe it's, it's a tag. Maybe the companies were doing it anyway, but the enabling environment is definitely improving and that we have to give Thank the government. Thank you. you. Know, that, is, that was basically the import that I wanted to see from the ambassadors here, that of course, initiatives made a difference, you know, in terms of the approach, in terms of uh, how to deal with it. Maybe it has been not as much as one would desire, but is the, is, is the movement visible? And is the movement in the right direction? You know, this is basically, and I, I thank you for your comments. Now, because of paucity of time, we were really not able to discuss, is collaboration in the Arctic Council, because India became an observer in 2013, and uh, of course, there are huge possibilities, huge opportunities, and of course, huge challenges, whether it is militarization, whether it is uh, mining, whether it is environment uh, protection. So there are so many challenges, but also so many opportunities. But then there were, we always have to keep uh, something available for our next meeting and next uh, conversation. <laughs> Ambassador, yeah, no, closing thank comments. You, thank you very much. Uh, I can agree with everything that's been said by my colleagues. 
so I don't have to repeat that. There's, but on the generality, there's so many opportunities and there's so much that we can do together. But we have to be realistic and pragmatic. And I do want to point out two things uh, <laughs> that need to be done from the Indian side, and that has to be done from, the, from your government side. Uh, we cannot just be sitting here together and just take about w what is good between us. There are certain things that are not working, and we have to we have to address those. First thing, we don't have a free trade agreement. The EU and EFTA countries, all of the Nordics, we've been since 2008 trying to reach a free trade agreement with India. It's a fundamental importance for smaller and medium-sized economies to have a clear trade rules. That's something that the Indian government needs to help us to do, to come forward and conclude those negotiations. Second, uh, more specifically uh, to uh, the renewable energy field, uh, there's so much licensing that comes in there. Because you're, talk, you're, you're using domestic natural resources, like water and hydro, or hot water and geothermal energy. And here, we need a bit more flexible, more efficient uh, uh, decision-making process in your government to get from the stage of ideas between our prime ministers to the field to actually doing the projects. We always stop there. We don't get to the project level. And that's what the business sector can do. The business societies, you can help us to put a bit of pressure on your, your administration, your government, to bring our ideas to the field level. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, you made a very important uh, point, Ambassador, about the uh, BTIA, Bilateral Trade Investment Agreement. But you know, there, there are issues, and I can see that those are issues which are holding up conclusion, are things like uh, tariffs and imports of uh, uh, liqueurs and uh, uh, alcohol and other beverages, and uh, also in terms of... Uh, that's exactly what I was coming to. <laughs> so I would hope that the Nordic countries and India would be able to get together and pressurize Brussels, because I think the bureaucracy in Brussels is uh, uh, very, uh, you know, there's nothing much to choose between Indian bureaucracy and the bureaucracy in Brussels. So I think there uh, we need to work together also. We are on the same side. And the advantages and benefits, if we are able to conclude the BTIA, is going to be mutual, is going to, be, is going to help all of us. Uh, Hanne, you have the last word. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little pep talk about the blue brief because that is one of the priorities that we have in the, uh, the embassy. We also have a green brief for which we've been touching up uh, on the LNG and so on. Then we have the golden one, that is the business. We have also be called, uh, been talking about that. We have the white one. I was mentioning this uh, health. This is a big, uh, well, it takes some money at, at least. And then we have the shimmering one, which is research which we are very happy. That's really something we really like to do, and it's going better and better with the, with the government of, um, of India also taking much interest in it. And uh, yes, we are not doing very much in education. Actually, I envy Finland a lot. I've been reading about their systems and what they're doing. I think they're really brave, what they've been, uh, the reforms you've been having there, and it's giving really good, uh, good uh, results. So, uh, but what we do in education is on the university level more than uh, anything else. And I think there's a lot of things we will not do because we just can't do all of it. Uh, that said, I want to give a hand to the audience here because I'm really impressed by so big turnout here. I can't believe you're that interested. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hanne, for this. And, uh, you know, my last word would be, I would, you are of course applauding, but I would like you to join me uh, in applauding our wonderful uh, set of panelists. I would like you to continue to applaud the Ananta Aspen Center and the India International Center who have got us all uh, together here. I think we have had a very full and uh, a very broad uh, range of conversation. Uh, last but not the least, I join Hanne in asking you to give the loudest applause for all of you here, because that's fantastic. You know, in Delhi, where there are so many events going on, and I'm sure all of us are aware of that, 
for us to have a full hall, full audience, and till about uh, 7.35 to have a very healthy attendance is uh, uh, very, very impressive. And uh, I think this will give this will give a greater confidence also to Ananta Aspen, to IIC, to all the others to get together, to get all of you again together here. And thank you. And that is all, I'm sure, because of the wonderful speakers that we've had. Yeah, thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.